Well, we're beginning a new series of sermons today, a four-part series on the greatest commandment. Uh, the text today is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. We'll be looking the next four Sundays at the commandment that uh, Jesus said was the greatest, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. No commandments greater than these two. We'll be looking at how we love God love our neighbors, our spouses, and how we love ourselves as well. Well, it's finally February. <gasps> January. Ooh, February. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's a month that holds many special dates. Yesterday, for example, was Groundhog Day, right? And Phil did not see his shadow which, as legend goes, means we're in for an early spring, which is good news after the Arctic vortex we experienced last week. If the weather today is any indication, maybe breaking out the swimsuits and sunscreen sooner than you thought. Uh, President's Day comes along in February, where we honor George Washington, Abraham Lincoln in the month of their births. And then there's Valentine's Day, the day which is all about love, hearts and candy and flowers, not to mention Hallmark cards and balloons too. But where does this love come from that brings folks together around candlelit dinners, that unites them in marriage, that families seek to build a firm foundation on? that poets strive to capture in rhyme and singers regularly vocalize about, reminding us that love makes the world go round. Well, of course, we know that love comes from the maker of the world going round, don't we? God, the God who the scripture says loves like no other because love is not just something God does, right? Love is who God is is and everything that he has made is an extension of that love and we the people created in his image find ourselves to be the primary focus of his affection so much so that even when we rebelled against him found ourselves lost in sin far from the one who called us into being that same god stepped in to rescue us like the song said to tear down the walls we built between us to overcome the enemy who took his stand against us. As John 3.16 explains it, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus is the love of God personified. The Word made flesh. And it's in the context of our relationship with Christ, the thing that grows after we embrace Him as Lord and Savior, we get to explore the wonders of His love. This is what the Apostle Paul prayed for over the believers in the church at Ephesus. And it's a living prayer for the believers here in the church at Jerseyville as well. As he writes in Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at verse number 16. I pray... That out of his glorious riches, God may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses all understanding, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of of God. Quite a prayer, isn't it? Oh my goodness sakes. This is the love that Paul tells the Romans nothing can ever separate us from. Not death, not life, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. It's a love like no other. And a love that seeks a response from those who received it who've been showered in it from the beginning. It's a love that God calls us to return to him, to reciprocate. God is all in with us. And he wants us to be all in with him. This is what we find at the heart of our text today from Mark's Gospel, chapter 12. 
For most of the chapter, Jesus has been in a constant dialogue with those who stood against him. The Pharisees and Sadducees. They've been peppering him with questions, trying to trip him up, to get him to say something that would be considered blasphemous. Words that went contrary to the scriptures. They, they spar over whether it's right for the Jewish people to pay taxes to Caesar. They, they chase rabbits over who a person will be married to in heaven if they've had more than one spouse on earth. But Jesus isn't thrown off by any of their inquiries, nor does he allow himself to be trapped by the trickery. Indeed, he shows them up with the solid answers that he gives, which leaves me more happy with him than they were before. That is except for one of the religious leaders, the one we meet in our text in chapter 12, beginning at verse number 34. Let's see what happens. Mark says, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Because, you know, they had the top ten, right? Then they'd added hundreds to that. So there were lots and lots and lots of commandments. So, teacher, which one is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Now it's important to note that Jesus is saying nothing new in what he tells the teacher of the law. All of his words are direct quotes from the sacred scrolls. He begins with the central Jewish teaching known as the Shema from Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This was a confession of faith repeated every morning and every evening by devout Jews since the second century before Christ. It was central to their faith critical to a people who were often guilty of chasing after many other gods in the foreign lands around them. And then, continuing with Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, the words they'd heard many times before, but perhaps had struggled to embrace or put into practice. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second, from the book of Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus says there is no commandment greater than these. Ooh, wow, that sounds like a tall order, doesn't it? Woo. But what would it look like, that first part, if we love God the way Jesus says we should? Well, let's, let's break it down piece by piece, okay? Okay. Jesus says to love God with all my heart, which means making him my greatest treasure, reserving the best of my affection for him, carving out time each day to build an intimate relationship with God through prayer, the sharing of my joys and sorrows and secret fears, valuing my journey with him more than anything else in my life. That's loving God with all your heart. He says to love God God with all your soul. Well, my soul is the essence of who I am and it's the essence of who you are too, right? That's the part that goes on forever. Loving God with all my soul 
means loving him with all that I am. Every fiber of my being. It's learning more and more about what he values and making those my values too because when we invite God to enter our lives, he will show us how to live in a way that pleases him. It may call us to change our priorities, how we spend our time, our resources, but it's the journey we're on, we're called to, if we're to love him with all our souls. He also said I should love him with all my mind, my reason, my intellect, which calls me to study his word and wrap my thoughts around his, which helps me to grow in my faith. This is where we ask him questions and sometimes wrestle with his answers. This is where we learn how to train our minds. Doing what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, where he writes, Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right. Think about things that are pure and lovely and admirable, that are excellent and worthy of praise. When we do this, we can love God with all our minds. And last but not least, Jesus said we should love God with all our strength. That's love in action. Persevering for him each day. Loving God by what I do and what I say. It's honoring him with our abilities, our resources, investing our all into the one who's invested everything in us. It means being willing to change and sacrifice things to have him instead. Being honest and sometimes doing the unpopular thing to stand by his side. It means listening to truth and holding ourselves accountable. It is this, with this kind of strength that we are to love him. Now, why does God call us to love him so completely, do you think? Because he alone is worthy of such unlimited affection, is he not? King of kings. Lord of Lords, Alpha and Omega, who is worthy of love like our God is worthy of love. He also calls us to love him like this because he knows the more we love him, the more we will be like Jesus. And the more we are like Jesus, the richer and fuller our lives will be. It is the straightest path to abundant and holy living. But there is a problem, at least on my side, and it's this. As much as I long to be all in with God, I don't always have the strength to love him the way he calls me to or to choose to use my strength that way. My heart holds a history of divided allegiances that betray a failure to love him completely. My mind is often muddled and meanders here, there, and everywhere. You know that. And my soul, the essence of my being, can be very neglectful of the one who made it. Sometimes my focus is more on the things of this world than the God who created it. And I find myself struggling to keep the greatest commandment. Can you relate? I think Peter could. We've referenced him a lot lately. Love Peter. Especially the part where he denied knowing Jesus three times. He certainly thought he was all in. He loved Jesus for sure. More than all the rest. But in the end, when he found himself in danger... When his life was on the line, Peter caved. All his promises of loyalty, the image he cast of an unshakable reliability came crashing down around him and he probably believed he was all washed up. Even after the resurrection, he hadn't kept the greatest commandment either. So not knowing what to do next, in John chapter 21, Peter has gone back to fishing. Not for people, but for fish. And that's where Jesus shows up and reaches out to the disciple who let him down. You know the story. Jesus asked Peter the same question three times. Question tied to the greatest commandment. Peter, do you love me? Do you really love me? 
And I've always been intrigued by the way Jesus asked that question the first time. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? I've often wondered, more than these what? What is Jesus referring to? Love me more than these? Is he pointing toward the fishing boats over here and asking if Peter loves him more than his occupation, than the work that defined him before he met Christ? Or is he pointing toward the, the nearby village where Peter's wife and family live? Can you put me above the ones you hold so dear? Maybe Jesus is referencing a crowd along the shore who witnesses miracles and hung on his every word yet turned their backs when the going got tough. People just like Peter love me more than these? If I'd been there, standing in Peter's sandals, I think I would have said, Lord, you know I love you, but I'm weak and easily tempted. I want to follow where you lead, but I get scared sometimes. I'm amazed by your grace and saddened when I fail to appreciate it. I want to be more like you, but Brett keeps getting in the way. I cannot do what you ask me to do without your help. I love you, Lord. Forgive me when I don't love you enough. What would you say if you've been standing there where Peter was? If Jesus knowing your life the way he does, ask you, do you, do you, do you love me? Really, truly love me? You see, the truth is, we cannot do this perfectly hard as we try. Like the people of Israel who first heard the greatest commandment. We may be good on Sunday and Monday, but the rest of the week can go slip sliding away. In this regard, we're much like Paul who confesses in Romans chapter 7, so I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a, what a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that's subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ my Lord. Mm. You see, if it were not for the meal that is set before us. If there had been no broken body, no shed blood, then we would be lost without a leg to stand on in the presence of the king. But because of what Jesus did on Calvary, like Peter, like Paul, we too can be redeemed. I like how Pastor Samuel Jack puts it, he writes, quote, We cannot keep God's commandments perfectly as he requires, which means we deserve death. Not just the death of our bodies, but also the second death of eternal pain and misery. But Jesus has suffered that death for us. And he has given us the reward which he earned by his perfect life. So we need to lean on Jesus. He comes to us to bring us his strength and power. We don't have the ability to keep God's commandments or live the life we ought to live. But Jesus has promised his help whenever we ask him for it. So we treasure Jesus by taking him at his word. And whenever we're in trouble, whenever we falter in our affections for him, we ask him for the help he's promised. And we know without doubt he will supply our every need. End quote. Jesus says 
If you love me, you will obey my commandments. And that's what we seek to do. That's our aim, our goal, is it not? To love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul and our mind and our strength. But when we, when we falter, when we don't love like He calls us to, or love in the way He loves us, then He's provided for us the help we need. The gift of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives to convict us. And the promise of His forgiveness that we confess our sins to Him. If we come clean about the times when a lack of love more clearly defines us. He draws us close to his heart and says that we can start again. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. And if that isn't good news, my friends, on this his day, I don't know what is. I close with a prayer from a great Christian pastor and writer of years ago, A.W. Tozer, who wrestled as we do with being all that God has called us to be. It's found in his book, which is titled The Pursuit of God. Let's pray together. Oh God, I have tasted your goodness and it has both satisfied me and made me thirsty for more. I am painfully conscious of my need for further grace. I am ashamed of my lack of desire. Oh God, I want to want you. I long to be filled with longing. I thirst to be made more thirsty still. Show me your glory, I pray, so that I may know you indeed. Begin in mercy a new work of love within me. Say to my soul, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Then give me grace to rise and follow you up from this misty lowland where I have wandered so long. In Jesus' name. the old hymn more love to thee O Christ more love to thee if you're a person that wants to make a new commitment to God a new commitment to loving him the way he's called you to we'd invite you to come and, and share that decision with us or maybe you have become one who's gotten kind of cold toward God like Lydia was talking about earlier uh, the dry bones are getting drier and you need to draw closer instead of moving further away Come and share that with us and let us pray with you. We'll have deacons here. I'll be here. Any decision you have to make, we'd invite you to come as the praise band now comes to lead us in our song of invitation. Let's stand and sing together. Oh. 
all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight we've all run to things we know just ain't right there's a better life there's a better life if you've got pain he's a pain taker if you feel lost he's a way maker if you need freedom or saving he's a prison shaking savior if you got chains he's a chain breaker if you believe it if you receive it you can feel it somebody testify if you believe it if you receive it if you can feel it somebody testify if you believe it if you receive it if you can feel it Somebody testify If you got pain He's a pain taker If you feel lost He's a way maker If you need freedom or saving He's a prison shaking savior If you got chains He's a chain breaker if you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Lord, the chains you have broken. You may be seated. Well, it is the first Sunday of the month, and it's always our privilege to gather around this table and celebrate what God has done to us and for us through Christ. Whether or not you remember the First Baptist Church of Jerseyville, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, then this meal has been prepared for you. At this time, I'd like to invite the deacons who will be serving this morning to join me at the altar of the Lord. have this word from the Apostle Paul in his first letter to the church at Corinth. He writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lucas, we did the prayer over the bread this morning. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you for this time of quiet contemplation that we can consider what you did for us. And as we hold the bread in our hands, that we think about you, think about the sacrifice of your Son and what it means to us and the great God that you are. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
And Jesus said, This is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. Paul continues by saying, In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for an opportunity to remember what you've done for us. Lord, as we drink this juice, we pray, Father, that we remember that you gave your all, you gave your blood, that we might have eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen.
And Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink in remembrance of me. And Paul concludes by saying, whenever you eat this bread or drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ has been proclaimed among God's people again. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. As is our custom, uh, the first thing of the month is the time you receive the diaconate fund offering. The gifts that you give this offering are used to be a blessing to those within our church and beyond our walls who find themselves facing special challenges in their lives. They are an extension and outreach of God's love from us to those around us. Let's pray for the offering, shall we? God, we stand here humbly before this table and think of what you gave to make this moment possible and our privilege to be able to give back, our privilege to be able to give these gifts to be a blessing to others, to be a reminder of your love flowing through us out into the world, a witness of the power and the grace and the provision of our Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. A few closing thoughts before we go. Um, a couple of prayer things that we forgot to mention. First of all, Gary Willis is having cataract surgery this week. It's his second cataract surgery, and we're hoping it's going to restore and make for clear vision for him. <laughs> he can see his lovely bride all the better that way. And Gina Meredith has a very important job interview on Tuesday, and be praying for her that God opens a new door in her life. Uh, today, in the gathering place, oh my goodness sakes, I saw it before I came in. It is a table laden down with lovely donuts, oh my goodness. And they're there, provided by uh, Marilyn Bauer's family and friends. She's not there. <laughs> well, she's there. <laughs> Last Wednesday, Marilyn Bowers retired after 59 years of faithful service to employers, employees, and customers. And so over yonder in the gathering place, uh, we're going to be celebrating uh, with Marilyn and, and the folks uh, such a milestone in her life. And it's also uh, Brenda Embley's birthday today, and she's one of the ones serving today. So we're, we're thankful for her and celebrate with her. Be aware that uh, there, uh, this is, uh, there's a football game. What is it, Robert? Uh, uh, there's some kind of fo there's a football game going on. Uh, huh? It's not legitimate, so you don't have to watch. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's a new part we call, you heard it from the pew. Uh, <laughs> so because of the Super Bowl, uh, there is no fusion tonight, so you fusionites can stay home and enjoy the game. Huh? Colton Skinner is at the Super Bowl, that's right, and Kim's there, that's right, that's right, they're there, so that makes it a very, very, very... <laughs> Oh my goodness, like, you mean inducted, not indicted? Indicted? <laughs> if, if Mitch Reynolds were here, I'm, I'm afraid it'd be a judicial. Oh, invited. That's even better. Yes. <laughs> you heard it from the pew. There you go. It's our new feature. Uh, <laughs> well, Elizabeth Moore was such a gift to us 
and uh, uh, went home to be with the Lord on Christmas Eve. Next Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, we're going to have an amazing celebration of her life. There'll be lots of music, testimonies from colleagues and students and folks who knew and loved her well, and we would love to have you here uh, for that event. There's going to be a lovely reception afterwards featuring uh, all of Elizabeth's favorite desserts. So uh, it's just going to be a great day to honor uh, the memory and the life of a very, very special lady. So we hope you can come. Uh, also be aware that next Sunday, uh, Tim and Kay Bias are celebrating their 30th wedding anniversary with a reception in the Fellowship Hall uh, from uh, 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock. So you want to come by and, and congratulate them on that milestone in their journey. Uh, and then two weeks from today, you'll note in your bulletin that our Family Life Ministry team is sponsoring a Valentine's Day themed fellowship meal after Sunday school. You can sign up for it on the registration books in the pews. You can call the church office to register. would like to know. But that's a very special day as well because that's the first day that Tim Thurmond and Michelle Thurman will be joining our church. And if you were here last Sunday, you know that they were called to our church by a unanimous vote of this congregation. And I took them out to lunch and I could barely keep them in their seats. They kept floating up in the air. They were so very excited. So uh, that's uh, coming February 17th. And then just to make you aware, so you'll know it's coming the last week of March uh, we're preparing to do a brand new pictorial directory. It's been about five years since the last one. And so uh, coming in March, you'll be hearing lots more about it. As we, but we just wanted to get it before you today. Uh, we'll be taking your pictures and producing a directory uh, for 2019. Uh, and I think that's everything there is. So, oh, there's something else. Oh, next, uh, next Sunday is the Operation Christmas Child Bake Sale. If you'd like to donate baked goods, you can talk to Jill. You can talk to Joanne. They'd be happy to... Uh, uh, help you know how to do that. So with that in mind, let's stand and sing our song of benediction. Join hands, if you will, if you feel like it, to blessed be the tie that binds. Here we go. Blessed be the tie. 